I had anything in my screen. Okay. Um, so I, I'm interested in preserving the dark skies and I have given a talk at the county about dark sky preservation. Um, so, you know, from the Los Alamos Ranch School, they even mentioned how our star studded darkness seemed immense. And maybe you've looked at this quote, um, and when the moon was full, it washed the land in a ghostly silver light. So, um, yeah, just reminding people, it's a lot prettier when we turn our lights out. And one more thing, um, we, we have a dark night tomorrow night at Spirio Fields at Overlook Park in White Rock. And the Astronomy Club volunteers will be there from 5.30 to 7.30 because it does get dark early and it's going to be very cold tomorrow. So we won't be able to tolerate more than a couple of hours. Um, we'll be looking at Jupiter and Saturn early on and then moving on to more deep space objects. So, okay, the star of the evening is Betelgeuse. And there's a lot more to say about the star than I can cover in under an hour. Um, but I, I do wanna hit some highlights and my intention is to motivate some interest um, for people to look into things that spark their curiosity um, in more detail later. Um, so Betelgeuse is in the constellation Orion, the hunter. And I'm just gonna point out it's the bright orange star right here. And the name comes from Arabic word, which either means hand of, or, hand of Orion or armpit of Orion. And it's typically pronounced Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. Um, I'm gonna stick with Betelgeuse for this. And I'll just kind of move on to slide the next one here. So um, the first question that might come up for a lot of people is what is Orion and how long it, has it been a constellation? Well, here's some artwork depicting Orion the hunter. Um, he's often seen with a lion's pelt or a shield that's covered in a lion's pelt showing his hunting prowess. And here is Taurus the bull. You can kind of see the V shape of his head here. And, you know, Orion is probably going to defeat Taurus the bull, but, you know, maybe not. They're frozen that way in the heavens right now. Um, you can see here we have Sirius. Also, it's unfortunately cut off. This is Canis Major, his dog companion, with Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Um, and in Greek mythology, Orion is the son of Poseidon. He was a great hunter, and there's a lot of stories about um, how he died and lived. The one I kind of like is that he was a boastful hunter, killing every animal as a foe. And Gaia, the goddess representing the earth, conjured up a scorpion to finally defeat him. And then Zeus immortalized Orion and also the scorpion by placing them in the heavens as constellations, but in separate areas of the sky so they wouldn't um, fight anymore, I suppose. Now, um, so I wanted to go back and see like what was the earliest mention of Orion. And here is Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, this was published you know, about 2,700 years ago. And um, in this first one, it, it sounds kind of like a creation story. On it, the earth he wrought, on it, the heaven and the ocean, and the unwearied sun and the moon in the blaze of her fullness, and on it, all the starry host, which garland the heaven. And then he mentions the Pleiades, this is Homer, um, and the might of Orion. So this is talking about Orion as a constellation almost 3,000 years ago. And, you know, probably this story was part of an oral tradition for a couple of centuries before that. Um, and then they say in Arctos, which is Greek for bear, so um, that's most likely Ursa Major, um, which in jest men call the wagon of heaven, whichever turning appears like, appears to follow Orion. And so this is like, the circumpolar asterism, the Big Dipper. Um, and it says it's free of the bathings from the ocean. So, you know, that might be true for the entire Big Dipper if you're high 
latitude, but um, it might apply to Polaris at many northern latitudes. And then um, in the Odyssey, which was published a bit later, um, Orion is mentioned as being a hunter. Um, and this is in the realm of the dead. So um, it says, and next I noticed huge Orion gathering wild beasts about the meadow of Asphodel into close pen, beasts he himself had slain. So these are like the spirits of the animals he had slain and he's, he's still the master of them. Um, and he slayed them on desert mountains. And it says, and in his hands, a club of solid brass and breakable forever. And you see a club in his hand here. And um, I thought, I found some other interesting passages. You might be seeing it for the first time, <laughs> but I really don't know. I, I haven't seen these in reference to Orion before or mentioned anywhere on the web. It, it's just by going to the Library of Congress that I found these. Um, so Betelgeuse and the constellation Orion, it's often referred to as the 10th brightest star in the sky. Um, it is a variable star, so um, you know sometimes it might be 11. Um, and in 1603, Johannes Baer designated Betelgeuse Alpha Orionis, which means it may have appeared brighter than Rigel. Rigel is right here. Um, it's the seventh brightest star in the sky. And you know, Rigel is Beta Orionis, not Alpha. Um, and then there's another mention that in 1836, Sir John Herschel was the first, and I, I put perhaps, to discover that Betelgeuse exhibited marked and striking brightness variations. But if you look at um, another um, publication here, this is um, the Odes of Horus, um, Ode number 27 to Galatea going to sea. Um, he says, mayest thou be happy wheresoever uh, thou goest, and me in memory bear, fair Galatea, boating Jane where vagrant crow shall bar thy way. But see with what a troubled glare Orion star is setting there. Um, so, you know, to me it seems they're not just saying that Orion star is a little bit, you know, changing its magnitude. It says, what a troubled glare. Are they talking about Betelgeuse? you know, 2,045 years ago. And, and this one also, um, Rise Aquilo as when the far, high mountain oaks you read, okay. When stern Orion sets, no star its friendly luster lend. So, you know, when I was at McDonald Observatory, it was so dark, you could see by starlight. You could get around. If it was cloudy, it was pitch black. You couldn't see the hand in front of your face. Um, so, you know, stars do lend their friendly luster. But, you know, what are they talking about here? Because, you know, what comes to mind is Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. So it might, you know, lend a little more friendly luster. But um, what's going on with Orion? I mean, was Betelgeuse really bright? I'm really speculating on that point, but I think it's kind of interesting. Okay, so what are we seeing? Um, so Betelgeuse recently dimmed a lot. Here's a picture of it in 2016 and also in 2020. Um, you can see it kind of appears smaller here. And you might've noticed looking up in the sky and seeing that it was a little dimmer. And people are talking about whether it would go supernova and now it's brightness is restoring. Um, but I'm going to sort of mention what magnitude means here. Um, Hipparchus, who was an ancient astronomer in Greece, and hang on a second, um, he lived at 190 to 120 BC, and he made a very detailed catalog of the stars. Um, charting their positions, maybe when he's sitting on the beach in Greece, I don't know. But um, he also 
he also bent them into units of magnitude. He called magnitude one the brightest stars in the sky and, and went down to six, which were the faintest ones you can see. And actually magnitude six is about the faintest you can see without a telescope or binoculars. Um, and the modern, modern magnitude, if you go from magnitude one to two, it's magnitude two is dimmer by a factor of 2.5 compared with magnitude one. So, you know, just between 2019 and 2020, um, Betelgeuse dimmed by a large factor, which is really anomalous, even for a variable star. And, um, you know, one of, the thing, one of the fundamental things you need to know is parallax for, for knowing how bright a star is and how much energy it's putting out intrinsically. Um, so here is an image from the Hipparchus satellite. This is the star Sirius. And Hipparchus was launched um, in 1989, and it was operated by the European Space Agency until 1993. And they made a really detailed catalog of parallax or distance for more than 118,000 stars, which was published in 1997. Um, and so for Sirius, you can see, you know, maybe there's two stars here and two stars here that are a little bit um, at a different angle from a different point of view. And how that works is, you know, you can look at this figure, here's the sun and, if we're in the Earth, on the Earth in July versus January, and there's a nearby star, that star is going to be kind of projected onto a different field of um, very far distant stars. So, for example, if your left eye is July and your right eye is January, and that nearby star is your finger, then you close your one eye at a time, you can see that the objects on the wall are, are kind of viewed at a different angle. Now that angle you can measure, okay? And we know the distance between our eyes. And then with trigonometry, you can find the distance to that nearby star. And then now you can see Canis Major entirely in this part. Okay, and I just wanna mention, you know, how young Betelgeuse really is, eight to 10 million years young. So, um, you know, when, when the earth was formed and the sun was, formed that was almost 5 billion years ago. Um, a lot of things happened, oxygen forming plankton, and then um, the tectonic plate shifting, and then much later dinosaurs, and then even later humans. And the formati formation of Betelgeuse was about the time that we know humans to be on Earth. Um, so, you know, and we know that by, fossil record and you know here's here's a jawbone that is you know perhaps one of the oldest 2.5 to 2.3 million years old so when Betelgeuse was born it was blue by the way not orange and um yeah that's that's a lot of history before Betelgeuse just to kind of let that sink in for a minute and if you compare it to the sun um, I just talked about age. The sun is 4.6 billion years old. It thankfully has a long lifetime of about 10 billion years. Its mass is one mass of the sun, one solar mass. And it's producing energy at this rate, four times 10 to the 26 watts. Um, Betelgeuse, okay, much, much younger. It's lived for a much shorter time, but its mass is much more massive. It's 16. 0.5 to 20 solar masses. And its luminosity is about 100,000 times that of the sun. And in terms of size, while there's no real distinct edge of this super giant star, um, we can think of it extending out to the orbit of Jupiter right now if it were placed where the sun is. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit about magnitude, and that's that's apparent magnitude. There's also absolute magnitude. So, if you put all the stars at a distance of ten parsecs and measured what their magnitude would be there, then you could compare them 
you know, one to another. Um, and also about the distance, in order to know how luminous a star is, you, know, you need to know how far it is away because it's going to radiate its energy um, in four pi star radians, um, mostly equally, and it's gonna fall off with distance as one over R squared. So, um, you know, the farther, if you're one astronomical unit, which is the distance between the Earth and the Sun versus two versus three, that radiation is going to get spread out over a larger area and be diluted. So, distance is important for knowing the luminosity. Um, now, you know, Betelgeuse is orange, and here is a picture of a spectrum. And it wasn't until near the Columbus Expedition in 1893 um, that Bean's Law establishes a relationship between color and temperature. You know, we think of, you know, if you turn on a, for plumbing, um, red is hot and blue is cold, but it's actually quite the opposite. Um, blue and purple are the most energetic visible light. Red is the least energetic, longest wavelength visible light. Um, infrared, you know, anything that's hot will emit infrared radiation, but um, the visible light might not be the peak intensity of that radiation curve, it, it would be invisible to us. So the surface of the sun at 600 Kelvin, um, it appears yellow because it's emitting the most radiation at yellow wavelengths, where a lamp filament um, is radiating, you know, where its peak is at infrared, but it still has some energy at visible. So we do see light from lamp, lamp filaments. And um, black body radiation is pretty interesting. It wasn't until 1900 that Planck actually derived the shape of this curve. And he had to um, come up with this uh, theoretical black body where matter and radiation are being exchanged. And the it, um, the exchange had to happen in these discrete quanta of H nu, and that was the beginning of quantum physics, actually. But um, anyway, the main point of this is that blue stars are hot, red stars are cool. And I also want to mention that in infrared wavelengths, if you look at the night sky, Betelgeuse is the brightest object. Okay, um, and then, you know, there's, there's something called the main sequence, and um, I guess what I just want to say here is that these stars are fusing hydrogen to helium in their cores. So in the first fusion cycle, um, that's what's happening. But I guess what I should say first is, you know, in order for a star to form, you have this interstellar medium or large quantities of gas and dust in space, um, gas that's been polluted by supernovas if it's um, a star that's forming more recently. Stars that formed a long time ago, they might be forming in non-polluted environments, okay? Um, but really what has to happen for a star to form is gravity has to win over other forces. And we could probably, someone could give a talk on protostars um, that would last an hour or a year in a course, however you choose to do it. But, um, you know, if gravity wins, then you have, you have a start of a star and it'll pull in more and more mass and become hot in the center. Um, and if it has enough mass and it be can become hot enough, then there's ionization and um, the hydrogen will become protons, you know, in an electron gas, and then they're positively charged. So, you have to have a hot enough and dense enough gas so these protons can come together and bind together um, and overcome their electrostatic repulsion. Um, that's hard to do. And if it doesn't happen, you don't have a star. If it happens, you have fusion. Um, in the sun, we something called the proton-proton chain dominates. The, the end result of that long chain of reactions is that four hydrogens become one helium atom. And the energy yield from that process comes from, you can think of it as a mass defect. So if you think of what the 
individual masses of the hydrogen were versus the mass of helium. Um, and then that mass difference times C squared will give you the energy produced in that reaction. Um, in massive stars, the, there's this CNO cycle, which is also the same reaction, the net result for hydrogens forming one helium. Um, this is something that was explored by Hans Bethe, and many corrections have been made to it over the years. But these are highly temperature sensitive. So if it's really hot in the star, um, this is what's going to dominate, although both processes can be happening in the sun and in massive stars. Um, the interstellar medium, um, we have about set by mass, 71% hydrogen, 27% helium, and then some heavier elements um, at, at small fractions. But anything higher than helium will often call a metal um, for astronomy. But here, here's some spectral types. These are all stars fusing hydrogen to helium. Um, they're different sizes, they're different colors. Like in the previous slide, um, there's O stars. This is pretty close to, you know, Betelgeuse is probably between an O and a B at 20 solar masses. But um, they're, they're kind of blue than white. And then our sun is a G star, it's more yellow and lower mass stars of orange and red, you know, not to be confused with a high mass supergiant, which is also orange. Um, so if you, this is Betelgeuse, eight to 10 million years ago, I just told you now it's out to the edge of like Jupiter's orbit, um, but this is how it would have compared to the sun when it was burning hydrogen to helium. Um, it went out to about one tenth the distance to Mercury at, at helium, which is farthest distance from the sun. And um, here's here's another way of looking at things. So when we look up in the sky, we we kind of see this this shell of stars, and it, it sort of rotates around us. But if you have parallax, and if you have a direction to the star, you can start mapping the stars in three D. And here are some of our neighbor stars. I do want to say, you know, to give you an idea of where the light year is, it's a distance. Um, if the distance between the Earth and Sun were squeezed down to an inch, a light year would be a mile on that scale. And um, here we have Sirius, um, which is the brightest star in the sky. It's about five solar masses. Um, so it is pretty significant mass, but it's also um, fairly close to us. And then you can see Alpha Centauri and um, Proxima Centauri from that system is the closest star to us. Um, Proxima Centauri is 4.31 light years from us. Sirius is 8.61 light years away. Um, but this scale is only about 150 light years. Um, in Arcturus here, it's, it's 1.1 solar masses and it's a red giant. So when our sun becomes a red giant, it might look something like Arcturus in 5 billion years. Um, now, Betelgeuse is quite a bit farther away. The maximum estimate I've seen is 815 light years and 250 parsecs. And if it's that far away, its measured speed is 35 kilometers per second. Um, so everything we're seeing from Betelgeuse today, including the dimming, um, happened, you know, hundreds of years ago, from 600 to 815 years ago. Um, and the sun is here, our solar system, and it takes about 225 million years to orbit once around the disk of the Milky Way. <laughs> Um, so it's made 20 trips in 4.6 billion years. Um, the sun speed in the galaxy is about 19.4 kilometers per second. So that's like going from Los Alamos to White Rock in a second, um, pretty fast. And you know it, it has a circular motion, which is nice and regular, but it also um, goes in and out of the plane of the galaxy. So it, it's like it starts going out of the galaxy and then the gravity brings it back in and then it overshoots and comes back. Um, and that has a period of 26 million years. Um, 
so Beetlejuice, you know, if it's, if this is 10,000 light years, it's, you know, on the order of 8,000, you know, light years away from our solar system. So it's, it's not too far away. Um, <clears throat> but it has a really peculiar motion. Okay, so here's, here's kind of another mystery of Beetlejuice. Um, where was it born? Um, it's not that old. And people say it's born in the Orion OB1 association. Now, o, this means O and B stars. So those are the big massive ones that don't live very long. And the thing about OB associations is that the stars don't move very far from where they were born because they haven't had time. Um, and you'll see them in clusters a lot. So here's Beetlejuice. It's, I've seen a range of estimates, 640 to 815 light years. Um, and then another star about the same distance in the Orion constellation, see? Um, Rigel is about the same distance away, 860 light years. Bellatrix is quite a bit closer. Um, the stars in the belt are, you know, all sort of of that order, with this one being quite, quite a bit farther from the sun. Um, and the scale of this, um, you know, kind of in the plane of this picture here is like hundreds of light years of these OB1 association. Um, there's a larger interstellar medium, you know, around that you can see at um, infrared wavelengths. Now, now Orion is moving really fast and its motion is strange. So if, if this is the sun and it's kind of at the origin of this coordinate system, um, where Z would be up from the plane of the galaxy and X and Y in the plane of the galaxy. Um, here's the Orion Nebula cluster um, and where it was 10 million years ago, 5 million years ago now with respect to the sun. And here's Alpha Orionis, Betelgeuse. If you take its velocity now, and you project where it would have been 10 million years ago, well, it's in a vacuum, okay? So people say, well, it cannot have formed, it cannot have had that velocity for a long time because um, it can't form out of nothing. It had to be in interstellar medium somewhere. And they think it was born in the Orion OB1 association somewhere. Um, so the story is that in these, in these clouds where you have a lot of young and very massive stars, it's not uncommon to have two very massive stars in a binary system. So if Orion had a more massive star as its companion star, um, that star would have already gone through its whole life cycle. Um, and the, the talk that I'm seeing everywhere I look is that it exploded and pushed Betelgeuse out of the Orion OB1 association. So really um, the story is it was kind of cruising along in its birth star cluster, and then suddenly it gets this push out of it. Um, yeah. And it, it's moving mostly perpendicular to, to the um, disk of the galaxy. So it's, it's actually a runaway star, meaning that it does have an anomalously high velocity and it's also at a weird angle. And I, I think Galen talked about this when he was talking about proper motions, he mentioned Beetlejuice. Um, so here's, here's an image by the European Space Agency's Herschel satellite in infrared. Um, and you know what they say here is that the supergiant has ejected some of its outer layers um, in a wind and then it's shaped into a bow shock as the star hurdles through space. But um, here you see some more interstellar medium that it's about to encounter, and that's not necessarily from the star itself. Um, this could be interstellar medium that's kind of sweeping up or plowing into, and then it's um, stellar wind is kind of pushing it away. Um, so for you know detailed images like this, a lot of times spatial interferometry is used. And um, I want to mention resolution. This is a real simple equation. So if you have, if you want to know the resolution of a telescope, you would need to know what wavelength the light you're looking at and the diameter of the objective lens. So the smaller this number is, the, the better resolution, the more details you can see 
Um, with interferometry, you want a large baseline. So the distance between the telescopes and the ray, you want to make large. And um, you have to do a lot of processing of images, but you end up with nice detailed images. And I just wanted to mention that the first time this was demonstrated was in 1920 um, by Michelson and Peace, and they were looking at alpha Orionis, Orionis Betelgeuse. Um, and they determined the diameter of it to 0.47 arc seconds or 47 mil arc seconds. Um, and the smallest diameter that could be measured with a full aperture, like a telescope, was about one arc second at the time. So um, Betelgeuse has been part of history for much longer than we have. <laughs> Um, so just to talk a little bit about um, what's going in star expectation. So here's a picture of the sun in, in astronomy class. You hear it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. So if you think of any mass element in the star, um, there's a force of gravity pulling it in and there's a force of pressure kind of pushing it out where that pressure comes from kinetic motion of the, the constituent atoms of whatever the star is made of. Um, here you could kind of think of the blues as being hydrogen nuclei and the red as being alpha particles, helium nuclei. Um, and you know, the hotter they get and the more densely packed they get, the faster they move um, in a volume so they can supply more pressure to support the star. Now, Betelgeuse, um, when, it, when it started forming, it was using a different cycle of hydrogen to helium, the CNO cycle. Um, it's very temperature dependent. So it's gonna be happening like gangbusters right in the center of the star. And there's gonna be a temperature gradient through the core of the star here. Um, and you won't have as much CNO happening on the edge. And what that does is it sets up convective motion in the core um, with the fusion rate being highest in the center. Um, but during the hydrogen burning, the core will contract. So you've taken, every time you go from hydrogen and make a helium, um, you reduce the number of particles by a factor of four because four protons become an alpha particle. Um, and you know, PV equals NKT, I think. Um, so the fewer particles you have, the the lower the pressure is, and this core is going to contract. Now, the contraction is a velocity. Um, we talk about gravitational potential energy um, incre um, increasing thermal motion of the particles, but you can kind of just think of the particles falling in. Um, and then the matter in the core heats, the energy of the particles, they're, they're moving around faster. The rate of energy production also increases. And then over a long time, um, because of that rate of energy production, which is essentially the luminosity of the star, um, the luminosity increases and the stellar envelope expands from the input energy into the stellar envelope and the matter will cool and change color. All right, so then, you know, if you look online long enough, you'll you'll see people saying that Betelgeuse was the yellow giant 2000 years ago. Okay, well, that's really cool. I mean, you know, I think it's entirely possible and I'd like to know more about how that could happen. Um, but there's a, there's a record of this that's old um, and this Chinese astronomer is saying that White is like Sirius, red is like Antares, yellow is like Betelgeuse, and blue is like Bellatrix. Um, now, 2000 years ago, that's like when we had Horace's Odes, which was kind of at the beginning of the talk, um, where he's talking about Betelgeuse, you know, lending its friendly light. Well, maybe not Betelgeuse, but Orion's, Orion in general. When Orion sets, we don't really have good starlight anymore. Um, so in the modern day, we wouldn't really call Betelgeuse too different from Antares. We wouldn't distinguish it as being yellow. Um, and then there are other reports of Betelgeuse being compared to the color of Saturn 
um, which would be yellow. So, you know, I don't want to say no. There's there's a lot of uncertainty still, I think, in um, how stars become red giants. But anyway, um, for the big picture, yeah, you'd expect a massive blue star. Its envelope color would shift from blue to white to yellow to red as it cools and expands to become a red giant. Um, and stars of 20 solar masses and up can have a brief yellow hypergiant phase. Um, that's like brighter than a supergiant, hypergiant. There's 20 hypergiant yellow stars in the entire galaxy. They are rare, which means they have a short life. So, you know, um, was Betelgeuse doing this for a brief period? But if you look at estimates, of how long Betelgeuse has been a red giant, um, you see anything between 20 and 140,000 years with the best estimate being 40,000 years. And um, as a red giant, the helium burning has started, not just hydrogen to helium, but helium now to carbon. And most of this is done as a red supergiant, but maybe not all. So, um, you know, Betelgeuse would move to red giant. Um, it's kind of hard to intuit this, and I, I'm not really sure if I'm doing this justice, but you can kind of think of the hydrogen burning ending. The core is depleted of hydrogen fuel, the core contracts, and, and when that happens, convection stops. Um, the entire star suffers an overall contraction as hydrogen burning is kind of shifting farther out in radius to a shell outside the helium core. Um, and the shell moves outward, it's adding more fuel to the helium core. The helium begins to contract and heat up. The helium will start fusing to make carbon. And when, when it gets really hot, now the envelope of the star becomes convective and it starts dredging up material from the core to the surface of the star. Um, and we think that the helium to carbon in Betelgeuse will go for like 50,000 years total based on the models I've looked at online. Okay, it's also shedding mass. Um, so for a star to shed mass, the radiation pressure and convective momentum has to be higher than the gravitational um, pull on it. Okay, um, so this is a picture from the European Southern Observatory Telescope in Northern Chile. This is Betelgeuse, the star, it's photosphere in this tiny spot in the center. And then they blacked out other material because it was too bright to show what's going on on the outside. Um, but you can see that uh, there's been significant mass for a very long time. And what astronomers do, you know, my estimate doesn't mean a whole lot here, but they'll, they'll look at how much mass it's lost and that, that helps them understand how long it's been a red giant. So um, it's believed, I'm just showing what Betelgeuse is doing now. It's um, fusing helium in its core and increasing the carbon fraction there. So it's still got some hydrogen burning going on. Um, there's helium that's you know left behind from this shell moving outward and carbon being fused. And while this is heating up, the outer la layers are taking in that energy and expanding. Red supergiants lose mass at a rate of about one millionth of the solar mass per year. Um, but I read that Betelgeuse does have phases of heavy mass loss. Um, and you can measure that material to estimate the time as mass shedding red giant. And like I said before, it's been doing this for about 40,000 years, we think. Um, also, just one kind of clue that you can get in astronomy is what the surface composition is. If you have high proportion of carbon-13, um, which is an iso isotope of carbon-12, it just has an extra neutron. Um, that means that that's something that would happen during the CNO cycle. And and that means that this outer region starts to become convective and there's been a dredge up, the first dredge up <laughs> where, where this is believed to happen soon after star reaches the red giant state. Um, 
and it's bringing this material from the center to the outside. Um, I just wanted to mention that it is a variable star and you know, here's this significant drop where it just, we were kind of worried it was gonna disappear and a lot of people love Betelgeuse. Um, but if you look at sort of a 20 year time scale, 1988 to 2008, you can almost imagine that there's like, uh, I don't know what we'd say, like 20 cycles up and down through here um, where it's getting brighter and dimmer. So you might think that it has a periodicity of about a year. Now you can do it for you and Fourier analysis on this and get more detailed information, but I, I just want to motivate the next slide. And um, <laughs> I'm going to thank Don Winchu for this equation here. But, um, you know, stars can change quickly in radiance. So if you look at fundamental pulsation periods, one is just like, well, how long does it take a sound wave to go from the center of the star to the outside? Um, Here's the time scales. You need to know the radius of the star and the velocity of the sound, which is the gravitational constant times the average mass to the minus one half power. Okay. So, you know, you can kind of think of a pressure disturbance just going from the center of the star to the outside. How long does that take? Um, for a one mass being sequence star in the sun, um, it takes about 50 minutes. If you have a 16 and a half to 20 mass Sun red giant beetle choose. Um, the average density is extremely low. And just with a simple equation, you get that the period is 400 days. Well, we know that beetle juice pulsates with a period of 376 to 420 days. So, okay, that's a lot simpler than making a whole computer model. And it, it gives us a little bit of um, a sanity check, which is kind of interesting. Um, also, there's changes in opacity. So stars are 25% helium by mass. And, you know, the helium is largely ionized in stars, especially deeper within the star. Um, if it's singly ionized, it tends to let radiation escape. Um, if it's doubly ionized helium, it's more opaque and it causes the atmosphere to heat up. Now, this is called the Kappa mechanism. Um, kappa just being the Greek letter that we use for opacity. Um, but but this, this lends itself to a pulsating star because when the radiation escapes, when you have helium plus, um, then your star can cool and contract. Well, when that happens, now you have denser material closer to the core and it heats up again. The helium becomes ionized. And now you have a high opacity and the star will um, trap that radiation and it'll use that um, kind of radiative momentum to expand again. And your star can pulsate like a beating heart and Betelgeuse is doing that. Um, there's convection in Betelgeuse. So here, here's an image of enormous convective cells on the surface. Um, a Betelgeuse, this was taken at the Infrared Optical Telescope Array um, at Arizona Whipple Observatory. But this was a three telescope interferometer. And there's large hot spots coming up from the center and then regions that have cooled and they're going back down to the core. So, you know, we've known convection is happening, but the recent dimming or dimming of 600 to 800 years ago, because the speed of light travel time, okay, was an anomaly. Um, it's not just a convective cold spot. So that was one of the theories. Well, we just have a really big cold spot. Um, but now it's believed it was a pretty big instability in pulsation, caused mass to be ejected. And then, and then that mass cooled down and blocked the light from the star that we were seeing. So hopefully that's kind of cleared out of the way again, we can enjoy Betelgeuse. All right, so um, what's gonna happen with Betelgeuse? Well, that kind of gives it away. It's gonna be a type two, we believe, supernova. All right, the most massive stars, they can continue fusing elements all the way up to iron. You need to have a high mass because as you get to heavier elements that are ionized, they're gonna have a stronger Coulomb repulsive force. Um, and also, you're not going to be creating as much energy, by the way, with 
with higher elements as you do with proton, protons to alpha particles or the hydrogen to helium stage. Um, and when you get to when you get to a state, when you get to these heavier elements, not only do you create less like photon type energy that will stay in the star for a long time, you produce neutrons which can zip through the star in about a second. Um, so that's kind of problematic. But I, I should probably go back and say, here's the type one supernova. There's, there's kind of two types. There's probably a lot of subtypes too. Um, but in a type one A, you have a binary pair often. Um, you have a star that's a white dwarf. It's kind of like for the sun, it would be if you had a carbon oxygen nucleus that's left over and it pushed off its envelope into space and it's gone. Um, so it's sitting there and it's pretty stable, but if it, if it gets extra mass accreted onto it from a, a nearby star, um, carbon fusion becomes possible and it's like entirely carbon and it's in a state of matter that's really dense um, where energy um, can travel through the star very quickly. You can get a runaway reaction and all of the energy of the star unbinds in a supernova explosion. Um, this can also happen if you have white dwarf mergers, like two white dwarfs coming together. <coughs> but um, Betelgeuse is more this type. So we believe Betelgeuse will eventually fuse all the way up to iron its core. It's, it's going to create a lot of neutri neutrinos and not generate a lot of energy. So those neutrinos are going to be lost um, and the core is going to collapse. <coughs> When the core collapses, the, the rest of the star is going to feel like it had the rug pulled out from under its feet, and it's going to fall in and rebound, okay? And that's the, the explosion, the supernova. Um, and that core collapse results in all the protons and electrons kind of losing their identity. They squeeze together and form neutrons, and you're left with a neutron star. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about this one, the supernova in history. Um, so here's one from 1000 AD. It was recorded by Chinese and Egyptians. Um, this was supernova 1006, and it's actually a white dwarf merger, merger is what people believe now. Um, but the Egyptian physician, astronomer and astrologer, um, said the brightness was a sprite of one quarter the full moon. Um, it was visible for three years and for weeks during the day. Now, this one was about 7,000 light years from Earth, so that's about 10 times farther than Betelgeuse. So, you know, based on that R squared geometric dilution, um, it's going to be anything we received from this star would be 100 times weaker than what we would see from Betelgeuse. Um, and then here's, here's Tycho's supernova. Now, Tycho was a Dutch astronomer, um, Danish astronomer. He lost his nose. He was um, a mathematician and, and his third cousin was also a mathematician and, and they, were, they were sort of royalty and intellectuals. And they, they got into a fight about who was the better mathematician and in a sword fight, he lost his nose and he had to wear a fake nose for the rest of his life. Um, but he observed and studied the explosion of a star that became known as Tycho supernova. It was bright as Venus and visible during the day. It was in the constellation Cassiopeia. Um, he called it Nova Stella, new star. And that's where this term supernova comes from. And just to kind of highlight a few stars in history, here's 1006. Um, there's also the Crab Nebula, which is a supernova in 1054. Um, it's also about 10 times farther away than Betelgeuse is. We don't know what the progenitor type was. Um, it was about four times as bright as Venus, visible during the day for 23 days and at night for two years. Um, here's Tycho's supernova. Um, and then there's Kepler's supernova. This is the most recent one. So there were kind of a cluster of them and we haven't had one for you know, 420 years or so. Um, 
It's 14,000 light years away. It's a type 1a supernova. Um, it was visible during the day for three weeks and even at that distance and at night for 1.5 years. So there's a total of eight in recorded history, you know, nearby that we could see with our unaided eye. Okay, not, not in other galaxies. There's far more than this. Um, ranging from 6,500 to 35,000 light years away, um, will Betelgeuse also become a supernova anytime soon? It's the question. So probably type two neutron star. Okay. Um, so, you know, we're due for another supernova. That could be another talk. Which, which star is going to go first? Um, as for the future, Alpha Orionis will continue burning helium. Okay, that's going to go for another 10,000 years or so based on a detailed model. But what's 10,000 years in an astronomical time scale? I don't think it's that long. Um, but we believe um, core carbon burning will begin followed by oxygen and then silicon. And you know these, these will all overlap. It's not gonna be like one finishes and the other one starts in a neat and tidy fashion. Um, but these authors, Dolan et al, 2016, they said in less than 10,000 years, Alpha Orionis will supernova as type two, leaving behind its neutron star mass of 1.5 mass sun. Um, and then this is from a stellar interiors book from 2004, this just kind of shows it sort of agrees with what Mayer's saying. Um, um, there's carbon um, that, that burns and then it, it produces neon and sodium. This can take from 1,000 to 10,000 years. This is a lot shorter time scale than the um, hydrogen to helium burning. Um, neon producing magnesium and some oxygen, that only takes 100 to 1,000 years. Oxygen producing silicon, less than a year. <laughs> so when this happens, it happens quickly. And then silicon to nickel 56, which then decays to iron, um, that, that only takes days. Um, so, you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to keep an eye on Betelgeuse and there's still a lot of things we don't know, including what happens to red giants. Maybe not even just at the end of their lives, but during their lives. Um, so I, I just want to end with astronomy is for everyone. Enjoy keeping an eye on Betelgeuse and other mysterious objects that capture your attention. And um, just a reminder, we have a dark night. If you can tolerate the cold, um, I think there is a member of the club bringing a propane heater, portable heater. Um, we'll be out there from 5.30 to 7.30. But if you do come, bundle up. And thanks for joining us tonight. All right. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I learned a lot of stuff. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I will thank Heidi again for that great talk. And um, we will not have a planetarium program or astronomy program next um, next Friday because it's the day after Thanksgiving, but we will be showing a full dome movie in the planetarium on Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, and that's the National Parks Adventure, um, which is uh, takes a tour of various national parks. All right. Um, oh, one other thing, um, you will get a survey in email um, for this talk. If you could fill that out, um, that would be great. And, um, because uh, it, it helps us with our um, with our programming. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, thanks Elizabeth for your help. All right, thank you. It was a great talk. Good night, everybody.